Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast from Altos Research. This is the show where we talk to real estate industry insiders and experts about the trends shaping the market today. Enjoy the show. Mike Simonson here. Thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast. For three years now, we've been sharing our latest market data every week in our weekly Altos Research video series. Uh, With the Top of Mind podcast, we like to add context to the discussion about what's happening in the market from leaders in the industry. Every week, of course, Altos Research tracks every home for sale in the country, all the pricing, all the supply and demand, all the changes in that data, and we make it available to you before you see it in the traditional channels. People desperately need to know what's going on in the housing market right now. And the market was you know, frozen so solid last year, and then the landscape changed dramatically. All of a sudden, mortgage rates are climbing again this year. So what happens next? If you need to communicate about this market to your clients, your buyers and sellers, go to altosresearch.com, book a free consult with our team. Uh, we can review your local market and how you use market data in your business. So, all right, let's get to the show today. I've got a great guest today, Robert Dietz. Robert is the Chief Economist and Senior Vice President for Economics and Housing Policy at the National Association of Home Builders. His areas of expertise include the housing market, of course, economic forecasting, uh, and the policy research, including the benefits of ownership and federal tax policy. He's often cited in, in on housing and economic issues in all the big media sources. We're going to talk about new construction today, home builders, uh, but also some policy and some forecasting things, all the things that we like to, to dive into and geek out about here on the Top of Mind podcast. So, Robert, welcome. It's great to be here. Great. So uh, so thanks for joining us. So let's start with just a little bit of background, your background and your work at NAHB and, and you know, how you how you how you got here. Yeah, actually, I, I became a housing economist when I was a, a sophomore in college. My, my economics advisor was a was a housing guy and basically said, you're going to you become a, an economist and then work on housing issues. And I uh, got a Ph.D. in economics at uh, Ohio State in uh, 2003, uh, went and worked on Capitol Hill for about two or three years, did a lot of policy work on on taxes and real estate and small business issues. And then I joined t- uh, NHB in 2005 at the very peak of the building boom uh, back prior to the, the Great Recession. Uh, and then I've, I've been at NHB ever since. And uh, the last uh, eight years or so, I've been chief economist and lead a team of about 12 economists doing housing research, forecasting, and, and policy work. Great. Well, I am super interested in hearing some of that forecasting and the policy implications. We've got some real interesting policy um, challenges in front of us in this in the country. Uh, but but let's start with the uh, let's start with the 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 year the the housing market year. It's been a year of surprising housing market trends, right? We started the year, you know, in frozen mode, and then all of a sudden things turned around surprisingly. We had more demand than supply. Uh, That, you know, the home builders specifically have had maybe the most surprising uh, turnaround this year. So tell me what, what we know now, your perspective on what we know now and about what's happening, especially with, with new construction. Um, t- tell me what we know now. Yeah, 2022 was was a challenging year, to be sure. I mean, going from an environment where we had 3% mortgage rates in the first quarter to, if you remember last fall, 7% or higher. But the, the, the fundamental characteristic of the housing market, and this has been true for years, has been a lack of inventory. Um, so on the resale side, you, you've got uh, roughly about three months supply. Uh, we need four and a half to five months uh, to have a balanced market. And when you don't have enough resale inventory, and that's going to be continued to be challenged by the fact that homeowners sitting on a two or a three percent mortgage are unlikely to put their home in the market. New construction has to be part of their their home search. Now, certainly there's been pricing out from the market, and that will continue. But as we begin to settle in and head into 2024, home building is preparing to increase its levels of production to add that inventory. And the, the number that really kind of sticks out to me is if you look at inventory levels right now in the market, a full third of homes available for sale 
our new construction. Historically, it's only been about 12%. So that, that new construction share has grown. And of course, the industry still faces the challenges that got us into this mess, which was a, effectively a decade of underbuilding. Uh, the industry faces a skilled labor shortage. There are policy issues like zoning and, and cost issues with land development. But ultimately, what we think is going to happen in 24 and 2025 is a gradual increase in single family construction. That's going to get us to a level of inventory that we reduce the housing deficit that exists in the market today. So, so then you're saying that, that the, the rate of new construction for home builders is finally getting back to a, a more normal pace? We'll, we'll get there. We're, we're not okay. there yet. We actually briefly got there during the COVID home building boom. If you think about single family construction starts getting up above 1.1 million, roughly for about an 18 month period. That's the level of production we need to be at to reduce the housing deficit. It's it's roughly about eight to 900,000 single family homes built a year for household formations and population growth. And then another two to 300,000 for second homes, replacement homes for homes that are destroyed or otherwise retired from the stock. So we'll get there probably by the time we get to 2025. The, the challenge for the industry is a focus on the supply side though making sure we have the construction workers to enable that level of output, making sure there's enough lots into the system. And the, the issue that's really front of mind right now is access to capital. Because I think when a lot of people think about the home building market, they typically think about the big national home builders. Those national home builders represent about a third of overall production and they get access to Wall Street capital. But for the two thirds of construction that's undertaken by smaller private and regional builders, they go and get a loan from a bank. And so when the prime rate increases as the Federal Reserve tightens monetary policy, the interest rates on construction loans, land development loans goes up and that acts as a check on housing supply. So navigating that particular headwind is going to be absolutely key. In the yeah, and I think I saw you, you at the NHB did some writing about this recently where like the banking crisis is actually maybe exacerbating that uh, this year. And and is that, how scary is that? How, how, how it's, much it's, should I it's focus It's an issue, on? yeah, to be sure. Well, so we were definitely nervous when you began to see one or two bank failures. And, you know, the big question was, were people going to take their banking deposits, particularly the uninsured banking deposits above that FDIC 250,000 amount and move from the small regional banks up to the too big to fail banks. Uh, because 85% of lending to builders, to land developers, comes from those smaller regional banks. So if their deposit base shrank, we would have seen a decline in the amount of loans available for home builders. Fortunately, some of the policy actions taken, some of the, the market corrections, we only saw about a 5% decline in that loanable funds basis. So it's an, it's an impact, but I think the, the bigger impact is just what the overall housing market's been suffering from, which is the overall increase in interest rates. And I'll give you a number, it should be shocking to, to realtors and anyone else in the industry. The average effective annualized interest rate on a construction loan right now is above 12%. So think about you know your six or 7% mortgage interest rate. For a builder, it's about a 12 or 13% interest rate on an annualized basis to go out and get the financing to build the loan or the house before they actually yeah. sell. Yeah. That's where the tightening's in play. So we get these little moments where housing demand peaks up. We just went through one. It's going to cool now uh, as long term interest rates go up again. But the challenge for builders is. They know it takes about two months uh, to get uh, permanent approval. It takes eight months to build a home. It takes two years to develop the lot. And so getting the financing available to meet the demand in the future is quite a challenge. Yeah. And, and so that and that doesn't look like it's backing off anytime soon, that cost. Right. Like those are ticking up as 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 at least as of right now. That's right. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons if you look at new home prices, they're up 30 to 40 percent since COVID began. Right. Right. Exactly. Part of that is that is is that financing cost in there. 
That's right. That's right. And building materials. Of course, we we all remember what happened to lumber in, in 2020 and Yeah. And, and I'd love to talk to you. You mentioned uh, labor. I'm, I'm interested in that and like the immigration Im- implications of labor. But um, do you while we're on the topic of of interest rates, do you forecast rates in, in your organization? And what do you what should we think oh, yeah. about mortgage rates and 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 financing rates for the for the coming year? We're still hanging on to our forecast that peak mortgage interest rates, at least on a sustained basis, occurred in the fall of 2022. Now, currently, we're we're in an upswing. Uh, you know, Freddie Mac said last week mortgage interest rates average about 6.8 percent. They will go closer to 7 percent in in the next week's data, given what we've seen with the the 10-year Treasury rate. But what we think is this will be the final upswing, basically, as the bond market capitulates to the idea that we've got one or two more rate hikes from the Federal Reserve. The Fed is then going to stay higher for longer. They're not going to ease until 2024. But we think by the middle of next year, we'll be looking at an environment where economic growth will have softened enough that inflation will be on a, you know, kind of a a real kind of reliable course down to the Federal Reserve's target. And that will ultimately bring down mortgage interest rates just below 6%. So we're talking the second half of 2024 going into 2025. The, the, The big factor in trying to forecast interest rates, particularly mortgage rates right now, is the spread between the 30 year fixed rate mortgage and the 10 year treasury rate. That's typically because of the operation of Fannie and Freddie, 160 to 180 basis points. Right now, it's 300 basis points. So we went to normal conditions in terms of the impact of the secondary market. We would actually see interest rates fall back by about 100 basis points. So that's kind of a trump card in our pocket in terms of where we think we're going. So expect ongoing tight conditions. I don't think we should say that 7% is the new normal. Some buyers can still operate in the environment. But 6% from a builder perspective does look like a rate at which uh, business can be done. And we think we'll get there on a sustained basis uh, sometime by the middle of next year. That's, uh, that sounds about as optimistic as you could get for the rate and economy environment. Like, sounds like a soft landing. Sounds like... Uh, is that, is, do you feel generally optimistic about your outlook? Well, we actually feel like this is one of those outcomes that's going to happen regardless of whether we have a soft landing or hard landing. If, if we have a soft landing, it means the Fed can ease sooner than we expect, right? That they can say, okay, you know what? Now core PCE inflation is headed down to its 2% target. It's, it's at 4% now. So it's, it's made a lot of progress. Future progress is going to come from shelter inflation reductions. Shelter inflation reductions are going to come about because rent growth, and we already see this in the data, rent growth is slowing. So that component from the housing markets there. Plus, we have about a million apartments under construction. And as that supply hits the market, rent growth will slow. But if we're wrong and we look at a a more harder kind of landing where economic growth goes down, when economic growth declines and you get recession risk, the 10-year treasury rate moves lower as well. So we we think by the time we get to the middle of next year, we'll either have mission accomplished from the Federal Reserve or they will have overshot their target, and in which case long-term interest rates will come down. Now, you know, people always ask, okay, you know, what would we look for to say, okay, your forecast is wrong? You know, policy mistake, a big expansion in government spending could certainly have an impact, right? Any, anytime you see the deficit go up, that's going to be inflationary. You could have a black swan event. So th- these are these are not 100% certainties. Uh, and certainly in the post-COVID environment, I think when you do forecasting, there's a certain amount of humility you have to bring to the task. But we feel pretty comfortable with the idea of thinking about the second half of 2024 and the beginning of 2025 we'll be looking at mortgage rates in that kind of 6% range. And, you know, the big builders in particular have found that if they can buy down rates below 6%, there are a lot of home buyers who are willing to get back into the market. And that's because of demographics. As those millennials, the leading edge is age 43 right now, as those millennials move into their their early 40s, the demand for single family homes is going to grow and grow and grow. And as we said earlier, there's just not the existing inventory in the market. So builders are going to have to fill that gap. And they're going to be able to do that 
a little more successfully in certain market tiers and certain geographies, uh, but we do expect production to increase. And 2025 through 2030 looks like a pretty good runway for home building growth. 2030s are going to be more challenging, but that housing deficit means the next five years as we normalize the market should be pretty promising for home builders across the country. Yeah, and, and we can obviously see that uh, this year with the buy downs, that the rate buy downs by the builders, like builders have had, been having a like a remarkably good year considering all the things and, and how different it is from where it was. So that evidence, I think, is really strong. Um, you mentioned in, in there uh, about the million apartments under construction and that we're, we're kind of getting there on single family home construction. But but a million apartments, um, you know, I spend, uh, you know, we publish all, a lot of our data on Twitter and a lot of, you know, the social media. And there's a big um, uh, group of folks who are really afraid of too much construction. Do we have too much coming to market or record levels of, you know, construction? Um, how should I think about that million apartments coming online? Is it uh, is there downside in there? Is there is there something to any worry about or is it, it you look at it as a, as positive? It's, it's, it's nuanced, right? So I think dividing the market between single family, single family is, is at least on the construction side, is about 90 percent for sale. Multifamily construction is 95% built for rent. So they, they are distinct markets. On, on the multifamily side, we are expecting production declines because that million apartments under construction is the highest total since the fall of 1973. Now, part of that is because the construction process is taking longer today. It takes about 14 months to complete construction of an apartment building. You know, a few years ago, it was only 12 months. So it's in the pipeline for two months longer. That's that's adding to some of that construction total. But without a doubt, we do face an issue of oversupply in some market. And then you combine that with tightening financial conditions for multifamily apartment developers, we're going to see a slowdown in multifamily starts. If, if anything, <laughs> we've been surprised during the first part of 2023 by the strength in multifamily construction. And when we look at the geography of it, it's a lot of suburban apartment construction. It's the impact of that shifting out of the geography of housing demand post COVID with hybrid work models. So yes, we do risk oversupply uh, in some parts of the apartment market. Then if you took a the, the look at the single family side of the market, I think there there's an unambiguous deficit Construction remains limited. It's governed by the lack of lots, the, the availability of skilled uh, construction workers, uh, zoning issues and the like. And that's the reason you've got such a tight existing home market is we simply have underbuilt the market. So there's a lot of debate. You, know, you referred to social media. There's a lot of great housing analysts in the industry. And there's some debate about the size of the overall housing deficit. Uh, Freddie Mac, I think, has got an estimate that suggests that we're short about Four million homes. The realtors have done research saying five million, or depending on some some toggle parameters, could be as high as eight million. Ivy Zellman has said, you know, depending on the demographics, you know, we could be at balance or even uh, some limited surplus. My team has put out an estimate by looking at vacancy data. We think the estimate of the deficit is about one million homes, so we're a little bit smaller. And we think that's evenly split between single family and multifamily. So our single family estimate is actually less than a million homes. But keep in mind the, the production scale here. We're building about eight to 900,000 single family homes a year. So a 750,000 deficit is still actually quite sizable. So again, it goes back to the idea of if we get above 1.1 million, that's above the speed limit necessary to, to bring that deficit down. It's going to take about five years to do it. So we need five years of relatively calm macro environment. We think that's coming uh, once the Federal Reserve ends its task on, on, on the inflation challenge, which was created by too much stimulus during COVID. Uh, and then builders can line up and get some certainty and be able to build single family. The challenge is building the right kind of single family homes. We need more smaller homes, higher density Townhouse construction, that's difficult to build. It's easier to build the, the larger home, the more expensive home. 
the buyer demand is more certain. It's easier to zone. It's easier to uh, get the lots for that kind of market. So that's going to be the challenge is building the right kinds of homes in the right places. But what we've challenged communities and local officials is get the right kind of policy in place. You will add housing stock. And then that's a great pitch to businesses to come locate in your market because your workers will have affordable housing. And a good example of that is Columbus, Ohio, which has got 10,000 jobs being created by an Intel uh, production manufacturing facility coming. And the reason for that is that Columbus, Ohio has an affordable housing market where builders can add supply when needed. And that's, that's the kind of market I think individual communities need to replicate. Yeah, so uh, lots in there. And, and I, I always love to ask my guests, like, which of the markets doing well? And so I like to hear that Columbus is, is interesting on that, on that front. That's, that's really notable for me. Um, the um, building the right kind of home, like we need entry level homes, we need smaller homes. We, um, and yet the economics are showing that that's hard to do, right? So it's like, as you pointed out, right? Um, uh, so what are the chances uh, that we do it? And, and if we can't do it, what happens to the market? Like if we can't, if we continue to underbuild entry-level homes, what happens? What, what's the outcome? Yeah, the, the expectation is that uh, the affordability challenges that we've faced for the last few years will worsen for that entry-level type market. Um, the, the irony here is that for the last 20 years, we've heard about the, the silver tsunami or some of these issues of the baby boomers are all going to hit age 65 and sell their homes all at once. And the market is going to be deluged with inventory. But actually, the, the challenge is, is actually the opposite. It's, it's lacking that kind of entry level type home. So I, I do think we're going to see some success in things like townhouse construction. Townhouses are a great kind of entry level type product. You can build a large number of them on a given amount of land. Uh, right now, townhouses make up about 20% of single family starts. I think that share will go up to, to 25%, but in the communities that zone for that kind of housing. Some kinds of communities will not do medium density, light touch density uh, uh, type zoning. So that, that, that remains a challenge. Um, but you know, overall, I, I think that the market will gradually increase in efficiency, not everywhere, uh, but enough to provide some additional inventory for those those millennials to to attain home ownership. Okay, so um, that so the townhouse as a uh, opportunity feels like there, like uh, there's at least a, a good trend there, uh, and probably some communities that are aware of that as an opportunity, even though. We like we don't really have solutions for our entry level affordability problem uh, on the horizon. Is that a good summary? Yeah, I, I think the, the solutions aren't in place. I think what's different than, say, 10 years ago is you've definitely got more policymakers talking the talk. Right. OK. Now, right. I, if you think back to 2014, 2015, this was the beginning of when we began to warn that we had moved from a market that was oversupplied the years right after the Great Recession, when there was undoubtedly an inventory glut. And we were moving into an environment where we were underbuilding. And, and, and me and my team, we, re we referred to this as the challenges of the five L's. So we've, we've already talked about them, right? Lack of labor, lots, lending, lumber, legal and regulatory hurdles, these factors that were holding back supply. And so, you know, policymakers, I think, have now understood, and COVID was this sort of natural experiment where economic activity shifted into the housing market, that we had a housing deficit. We don't have enough homes. So one is acceptance of the problem, that there is a housing crisis. We don't have enough inventory and housing affordability conditions are going to be challenged. In fact, we expect some declines in the home ownership rate this year as a result of some of the pricing out that occurred in, in 2022. But then where the rubber meets the road, are they going to implement policies that would allow us to add that additional affordable inventory? And we, we've talked a lot on the for sale single family side, but this applies to the for rent multifamily side as well. So those policies and, and there's no single, simple, scalable solution. Like we have to enact improvements in all these areas. So it, it means uh, resources and funds into workforce development in the construction sector, for remodelers, 
apartment builders, single family builders. It means zoning reform that allows you to build the missing middle, townhouses, smaller multifamily, entry level homes on small lots. It means getting a new softwood lumber agreement with Canada. We have a 9% tariff on Canadian lumber and a third of our lumber comes from our friends up north. And so the lumber market, which if we all remember in 2020 and 21 shot up, uh, was adding $50,000 to the typical price of a home because of those higher lumber prices. We face those same risks today. There's not been an increase in domestic lumber production and we still have the tariffs. So if single family construction goes up as we think it will in 24 and 25, lumber prices are gonna go back up again. And then the, the big run, long run challenge is just land development uh, in, in general. And in fact, that's one that can have a lagged effect because higher interest rates for land development loans today mean fewer lots two years from now. So as we move into an expansionary period, a recovery period, 24, 25, a lot of markets are not going to have enough lots. And so you'll see volatility in lot and land prices. This is the lags and leads that occur when you move from the Federal Reserve's policy through the home building sector and the housing sector. So, uh, you know, state and local governments, federal governments, the Federal Reserve itself, there's all roles to play. And as I said, there's no simple single solution we can point to. We're going to have to make improvements on all these fronts. The good news is we've got lots of folks talking about them. I would like to see housing and home ownership, a 2024 presidential election issue. Uh, and if the home ownership rate is declining for the big block of voters and the millennials, it likely will be. That's uh, yeah, for sure. It's a there is a it's a top of mind issue for uh, a lot of young people around the country. It's like it seems to be forever unaffordable is a really interesting challenge. You mentioned so I wasn't really like uh, I'm not a lumber guy, but I, but the nine percent tariff is a really fascinating. Uh, mix that that adds a ton to cost, and we're talking about like how can we lower costs? That's a really fascinating one. I'm also, I'm a I'm a free market labor like a free, pro immigration person. Uh, tell me what should I know about immigration? Yep. Uh, and like, are we getting better? Is it like are we still screwed? Yep. <laughs> what 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 should we know about immigration? How it impacts builders as well as as demand side. Yeah, immigration is kind of an interesting one because it does affect the demand side of the market as well as the supply side. So, uh, for example, in the building industry, about a quarter of the industry's workforce, and we're talking the entire workforce, including sales and marketing, other kind of business services, but about a quarter of the industry's workforce are non-native born Americans. They're, they're immigrants into the sector. So providing certainty there is important. Now, I will say where the industry has failed is, is less getting immigrants into construction and really, frankly, getting high school graduates and community college graduates, trade school graduates into residential construction. The, the task there is to recruit, train, and retain workers in the residential building sector. And there are a lot of organizations, including most prominently the Home Builders Institute, that are trying to recruit those workers. I, th I think some immigration reform would certainly help. On the demand side, of course, uh, you know, if, if it wasn't for immigration, if you look at the, the population data of the United States, the U.S. population would have been declining for the last 10 years, if not for immigration. The, the birth rate in the United States in terms of the fertility rate has fallen below that kind of break even level of 2.05 births per woman. So when you see that decline in the birth rate and some weakening in immigration, it does mean that the, the population growth rate's fallen in half. And this is why there is some debate over how big the housing uh, uh, deficit uh, is right now. But I think immigration reform can be part of it. But here's the key issue. In residential construction, we also have to increase productivity of builders and remodelers. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Increasing training, uh, but it could also mean changing the ways that we build homes. So right now, about 3% of single family homes are what we call modular or panelized construction. They're effectively built in a factory. Uh, now, this is different than manufactured housing or mobile homes. Uh, these are homes that look like traditional site built homes built on a foundation, a home ownership product, but it's only 3%. Here's the thing. In the last few years, lots of discussion about 3D printing and other kinds of technologies. If you look at the data, that 3% number pales compared to the 8% share that was factory built back in the late 90s. 
So the share has actually gone down while the conversation has increased. And so what we expect is technology coming into the sector that's going to result in some productivity gains. Again, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick, but some productivity gains that will help us deal with that skilled labor shortage. So I think this is another great example where some immigration reform would certainly help provide certainty to employers in individual markets where immigration is a big source of construction labor. If you think about like Florida and Texas, it's more than half of the industry, but also then technology. And then the big thing is telling the story of housing as a career, getting high school graduates, community college graduates into the housing sector. And again, that could be as a realtor, as a banker, but as a construction worker as well. And you know the, the, the big topic of the conversation the last few months has been AI and how AI is going to change the labor force. AI has been mostly hype in the last 20 years, but it is going to have an impact on jobs. It's, we're going to have fewer office jobs, which means the jobs that are going to be more in demand in a relative sense, the chef, the nurse, and the construction workers. So that's something where NAHB or state and local associations and, 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 and labor development organizations and big players in the sector, we need to be contacting high schools and community colleges to get people into the housing industry. So you look at AI as essentially a, a sort of a boom to, to the construction industry, to those jobs in the construction industry. Does it, does it make them more valuable? Does it like, does their, do their wages go up? We, we, we think the overall labor market is, is due for a reset. You know, I, and I, you know, I recognize as somebody that went to college for 10 years and I'm, I'm married to an economist as well. She went to college for 12 years. We're not probably the greatest voice to kind of get, uh, kind of lay this out. But if you think about how the labor force is going to change, more AI, which again is going to reduce that demand for office workers. And I think we're going to see a rise in training designations from big companies. So rather than getting a four-year degree, which can be expensive and cost you know, $200,000 with lots of student loans, which has been a, an issue in the, in the housing market as well, you could go get a training designation, which will act like a a bachelor's degree from a Google or from an Amazon in terms of coding or some other things. That then opens the door for other sectors, including construction, to offer their own kinds of training designations. And that's why a partnership with community colleges, trade schools, is really going to be key because there's lots of different training designations that will train tomorrow's carpenters and plumbers and electricians. And if you spend five, seven years as a, you know, kind of a skilled tradesperson, that is then the, the liftoff point to become your own subcontractor or your own plumbing company or remodeling company. And from that, then you launch small business. So one of the things I really enjoy as a free market guy working in the home building sector and the housing industry is we get to study the traditional entry points into the American dream, home ownership, and small business ownership. We're the defenders of them or the promoters of them because we're the great originators of those, those kind of outcomes that we want to see. So, you know, getting the, the training resources there, taking advantages of the technological changes that we think are coming. And this isn't great news for the colleges, but I do think it is good news for the skilled middle sector part of the labor market. That's uh that's a really interesting take. And, and uh, uh, Surprisingly optimistic, I'd say. Like, it feels very bullish on on where we have uh, like room to grow in the future. Uh, it does feel, uh, you know, it... economists. Yeah, economists by their nature tend to be short run pessimists and long run optimists. That's right. <laughs> so that's what you're exactly. Saying. I'm I'm with you on that. I I, I get it. Um, and we we have a lot of we have a lot of productivity uh, to grow. And in fact, that brings up another question I had. So you mentioned that that. We're down to three percent of the homes that are being built now are have have a, like a factory component, and it was eight percent in the nineties. Um, that I had no idea about that. Like I'm paying attention to the conversation uh, and the the venture money, but so what was being built? What were the components that were being built in the nineties that was working then that we're not using now? Yeah, the, the, the difference is that it, it's partly the shift in geography. There's been a lot of changes where homes are built. Today, more than half of single-family home building is built in the South. 
In fact, if you look at the top markets, three of the top five single family home building markets are in Texas. Three of the top 10 are in Florida. So it's shifted away from the Northeast and from uh, the California markets. And a lot of the, the, the modular and panelized construction, the, the factory built housing was really concentrated in parts of the East Coast where there were traditional factory centers of production. Think like Pittsburgh, you know, Pennsylvania type markets, uh, North Carolina with furniture. That's where you had modular construction. So as home building has shifted out into newer markets, the, the, the travel costs, the transportation cost goes up and that reduces the market share. And that's what's going on. So as you start to see venture capital money going into these new technologies, not only is it a new production process, but it's a new geography. Thinking about accessing the Texas markets, accessing uh, maybe some of the, the California markets that previously haven't benefited from this. So we do think that that share is likely to go up to, in the five to 10% range. But to go back to something I said earlier, there's no simple single scalable solution. Uh, you know, modular construction is not going to work in every single market. Um, it, it is going to require workforce development uh, to provide the housing we need. That's that's really fascinating uh, uh, to think about the location of the factories and how much that matters. Um, well, you talked about being long term optimist. So let's talk about longer term future, like rest of the decade. Um, you know, we've had we have now we're in the millennial peak earning and home buying years. And that's been driving a lot of our demand, especially through the pandemic. Um, and it's also evidence, I think, of this year, the surprising resiliency of the housing market this year is, is millennials going, well, it's mortgage rates at six and a half. I'm buying at six and a half. Um, uh, but that trend ends, you know, trails off in, uh, in a few years. Um, and we've been kind of hostile to immigration. So that trend cools down. And uh, and so what does the second half of the decade look like to you for housing? We're definitely going to see an increase in single family production. So uh, estimates saying that we'll get up to 1.3 million single family homes a year, 1.4 million. Those are exaggerated. We, we simply do not have enough construction workers in the training pipeline to get there. But getting to 1.1 or 1.2 million single family homes built a year, I think is attainable. It is what we're expecting between 2025 and 2030. That's a period of time of that 750,000 single family home deficit, we think will come down into the 200 or 100,000 range. So we'll build out and then we'll get to kind of equilibrium levels of production. This is where the demographics do begin to claw back home building production. But during that same time period, we're going to see a growing growth of remodeling. Uh, if you look at the data, for example, 20 years ago, remodeling was about 30% of residential construction. Today, it is more than 40% of overall residential construction activity and headed to 50. And the reason for that is the aging housing stock. The typical age of an owner-occupied home in the United States right now is about age 40. And it's been growing quickly because of the lack of new construction in the market. So we're going to see a change in the kinds of home building activity undertaken as we get to the end of this decade. More remodeling, more teardown construction. The teardown construction share right now is about 9% of single family starts. Just a few years ago, it was only 6%. So we think that number is going to quickly grow to 12 or 15%. And that's basically replacing an older home, homes that are aged 80, 90 years old, and replacing it with a more energy efficient, more resilient home, uh, typically in an existing neighborhood. So you get some of that density benefit as well. So uh, there's going to be a lot of roles to play within the residential construction industry, remodelers, single family builders, the big ones, the small ones, and apartment developers. But there will be some of these shifts of activity. And then, you know, we, we talked about long run optimism. There are certainly some big headwinds as we head into the 2030s. That's when the demographics begin to move against us. We know Generation Z uh, and then Gen Alpha beyond them is smaller generational groups. So there will be a demographic uh, headwind turning into a tailwind and, and pushing against us. Um, and then uh, we'll have some policy issues. Uh, Social Security and Medicare 
mean higher interest rates and higher tax rates likely in the 2030s. And that's going to make the environment for buying a home more challenging. So I, I think if you're trying to balance your, your interests and think about business planning over the next decade, it's navigate the way through the end of the Fed tightening cycle. 2025 through 2030 look pretty promising and then be more cautious as we enter into the 2030s. That's a, uh, a uh, um, incredibly clear view of the, the, the next uh, 10 or 15 years. I really appreciate that. I ask all my guests what they think about the next decade or so, and that's, that's among the, the most precise. So I really appreciate those insights. One last question on that. We talked, you talked about construction volumes in those times. What do you think about pricing? If we get to a world where we are more balanced in our construction, do prices come down or do they, does price growth moderate? What, what do we think of, what should we think about home prices over the next decade? Yeah, price growth is probably going to moderate, but uh, an expectation that you're going to see big drops in new construction pricing is, is unrealistic because of the fact that if you look at material costs coming out of COVID, they have gone up in aggregate 35 to 40 percent. Land and lot pricing has gone up as well. And then we are going to have some lingering effects of higher financing costs, which work their way into the system. So I, I think what we're, we're likely looking at is where demographics combined with a catch up in nominal wages and a decline in interest rates are going to offset some of the supply side increases in costs. What that all suggests, though, is that the expectation of a period of overbuilding or oversupply is likely uh, is, is, is unlikely as we move into the, uh, the market of the next five years, because there's just simply not the workers and materials necessary to build those homes. Ah, that's a that is a great, great, uh, solid, well-founded view. Uh, Robert, I know you've got to run, so we'll wrap it up here. Where can our guests, our listeners find you uh, and read your stuff? Uh, I know we're, we're Twitter friends. Where, should, where, where do you like to point them? Yeah. So if you're interested in following the economics of the home building industry, I recommend that people check out ionhousing.org. It's E-Y-E on housing.org. That's NHB's economics blog. It's our primary uh, production pipeline for, for all the research that we do. And, you know, even if you're not in building or remodeling or apartment development, uh, it's a great place to look at economic data, particularly the supply side of the housing market. That's really what we focus on. And it's uh, what we wish the Federal Reserve would focus on as they think about the future of uh, Fed rate hikes here at what we hope is the end of the tightening cycle. All right, everybody, that's the Top of Mind podcast for the week. Thank you all for being with us. If you found that you uh, enjoy the podcast, please uh, like it, leave a review on your on your podcast station so that other people can find it. And we'll be back again next week with another great guest. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to Top of Mind. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate leaving a nice review on your favorite podcast app that helps other people find us as well. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. See you soon.